I am Jenny Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am so happy to uh, welcome all of you to this year's appearance by Professor uh, James Stewart, who has uh, done so many good programs for us in the past. His series this year is Earth and Environmentalism, a History. I don't know if anybody noticed, but I put the sign out and I wrote it out in green. I hope you noticed that I did it in green, <laughs> deliberately. Um, these series are made possible with the cooperation of our great partners in these endeavors, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, which we thank very much. We do have an OLLI representative here today, and if anybody uh, is, uh, has wants more information about OLLI, she's standing at the back of the room, or she's standing in the hall right now, but uh, please uh, ask that lady. And so, without further ado, I am going to turn the microphone over to today's speaker, Professor James Stewart. Thank you. Thank you for coming out when the wind chill is terrible and the black ice is on the road and all the different things that can keep people at home. Um, if I were you, I probably wouldn't have showed up today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a really awkward way for me to, to do this. Uh, for those of you who have been here before when I've been talking, I'm somebody who roams the room with a microphone. I like to be unanchored. I like to be able to see way over there to see what you're thinking if I can. And somehow I found myself in a static technology where I have to stay in one place. And as a consequence, uh, a lot of what I would like to do today I can't do. And I'll try and do my best anyway. Uh, I promise that I'm not coming back here again if I have to do it this way much longer. I'm serious. Now, I mean, this is all tied up with filming and stuff like that that I had no idea about until I got out here. So I'm stuck in one place. You're way over there. Uh, I don't know what to do about all this. Let me tell you what this, uh, this is a three-part deal. And I'll be here this week, next week, and the following week. And what I'm going to try and do is to use three different locations, big cities, as focal points for understanding the environmental history of the whole United States <laughs> in not a very long time. Our three cities are Boston, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Boston is what we're going to be dealing with today. We'll be dealing with New England. We'll be dealing with the 17th and 18th centuries. When we get to Chicago, we're going to be dealing with the basically the making of Minnesota and the whole business of Chicago as being the central city that develops the whole of the Midwest and reaches all the way out to satellite cities going all the way through Kansas City uh, on out to the 100th Meridian, which is an important place that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the third of our three parts will deal with Los Angeles, which right now is wondering where it's going to get its water from, along with a lot of other places that are situated in places where they shouldn't be situated if you have to rely on natural rainfall in order to be able to make things work. As you probably know, there is this thing called the 100th Meridian, and after that, you're into, arid you're into aridity and into big water systems that go one way, and the past 80 to 100 years, people have been struggling to try and take those big waterways like the Colorado or the Columbia River and turn them someplace else. So we'll start in New England with Puritans. <laughs> We'll end up in California with Gavin Newsom, the governor there. And in the meantime, we'll have Chicago as the middle organizing point of what turns out to be finally a big panorama having to do with being able to think about the development of the natural environment and our development as a nation all at the same time. So that's the plan. <laughs> not whether I can do that or not, I'm not so sure. Uh, this is also a topic that I, it's a really scary topic. Uh, it's a topic that doesn't have a whole lot of, um, what would you call it? It doesn't have a whole lot of power to reassure 
the people who study it, that human beings, you and I individually, have a whole lot of agency to change things. Uh, it's a topic where instead, and I think I can speak for more than just me, I find out that I'm the problem in the sense that the kind of con high consumption society that we live in is what allows us to begin at the same time to think about the limits of what consumption can be. So we're gonna take a long run at this and one of the most scary parts of it, which is what we'll deal with today, is how long we've been struggling with this whole big problem of what we do when we're the top predator. And where the best form of predation to keep us under control is ourselves. If you lose six million people in World War II, that's population control. Nobody else is going to knock us off but us. And it's a hard matter to try and get into. Sometimes I think that we're all in sort of a state of unconsciously expressed collective mourning about where we don't want to recognize we really are. So trying to write this as history uh, is probably no different than any other kind of history that people want to write. You have a problem, you ask the question, where did it come from? Uh, if suddenly you realize that uh, men have been dominating women for a long, long time, you get women's history. On and on you go with whatever the, the question is that society wants to ask itself about what engages it in an annoying and um, what provocative way. You want the past to tell you something about how you got here. So that's, what, that, that's really what we're going to try and do. Now, everybody has a worksheet. Y'all got a worksheet? Can you guys hear me over there? Can you even see me? <laughs> I feel like I'm communicating with Australia over there, okay? <laughs> okay, the worksheet's a big deal. Uh, I'm not somebody who likes to work a lot with PowerPoint and crap like that. <laughs> By the way, there is a wonderful satirical PowerPoint of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. <laughs> and if you haven't seen one of the most important and eloquent pieces of American political prose turned into something that'll put you to sleep in 10 seconds, that's what PowerPoint will do. Uh, when we get to Chicago and when we get to uh, the building of the big dams in the, in the Great West, I'll throw a bunch of images up on the screen, but that's all it's going to be about. The, the worksheet is a way for us to try and get accustomed to something that happened a long, long time ago in language that's hardly recognizable for us as English. That all has to do with New England in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And it's all about Indians. And it's all about colonists. And it's all about what happens when they meet and what happens to the land as a consequence. Now, we could do this in a lot of places. It's not necessary to do it in Boston. You could do it in Taos, New Mexico, if you wanted to. And you could do it with the Indian communities there that encounter the Spanish coming looking for gold and silver in the same period of time in the 16th and 17th centuries. You could do, it, you could do this same sort of exercise earlier if you wanted to go to Santo Domingo and find Christopher Columbus looking for gold up in the mountains to find out what happens to the Tiano Indians that occupied that place. We could do it if we wanted to by watching Russian slaveholders pushing Aleut Eskimo Indians down the West Coast hunting for any kind of fur-bearing animal. This, the kind of thing I'm talking about here, and I think it's important to try and emphasize this at the outset, this is, the, this is one slice of something that's happening in lots of different places. Uh, it usually is called discovery. Sometimes you call it conquest. You could turn it around and face east if you wanted to be a Mohawk, or if you wanted to be a Narragansett, and you tell this story from the opposite perspective. What I'm going to try and do is to blend all that together if I can. The worksheet helps you with this. And the way to get started 
It's not on the worksheet, but I'm going to do this. In 1968, an anthropologist named, what is his name? I'm trying to remember. Garrett Hardin wrote an essay called The Tragedy of the Common. People have heard of that? Know what it is. He took that phrase, tragedy of the common, from another essay that was written a whole lot earlier in 1833 by a guy named William Foster Lloyd, who was living in England. William Foster Lloyd's tragedy of the commons was built around the idea that communities have common land. Remember back, you know, the town square, all that kind of stuff? And the idea is that everybody who was a citizen of the town had the right to pasturage in the common. And Lloyd's concern was people cheating. The idea is that there's a limit to the number of cattle that you can raise and uh, graze on the common. And if some guy comes along and sticks in a bunch of extra cattle, he's going to come away richer than you are. And you're not only going to come away poorer than he is, you're going, to become away, you're going to come away permanently poorer than he is because the common itself will not be able to produce as it used to. Now, what Garrett Hardin does is inflate that whole concept. And the common becomes the oceans. The common when you have a, well, we'll, we'll I'll talk about something that uh, we'll talk about later. There's a huge aquifer called the Oligala Aquifer. If you chart its size, it will amaze you at how big this thing is and how much water it delivers all throughout the upper Midwest and into the Plain States. It's sitting there. It's Lake Superior underwater. It's free. It's depletable. It's going fast. What goes out of it makes private profit, creates jobs, allows you to be able to buy bottled water in places like, um, where was I just recently? In Guatemala, where the water is not drinkable. The common is a place where everybody has a chance to be able to take out what they want, and there are no rules. A while ago, there was a lot of discussion about pirates in the Horn of Africa. You know why those pirates are there? It's because Russian trawlers have taken away all their fish. There's nothing to do if you're a seafarer and you know how to run a boat except attack other boats. That's the common. We are going to be dealing with that problem in New England when it comes to colonists in India. Okay? So in order to be able to get us set up to do this, geez, it feels funny. I should be over there. <laughs> I really should be. I want you to think about a couple of different terms. They're on the sheet. First is commodity, and the other is profit. Think, uh, and each has a primary and a secondary definition. What today is its secondary definition used to be its primary definition. And then it switched in the period of time that we're talking about. <laughs> okay, let me explain. A traditional definition of commodity means a condition of comfort or ease. You can find the word commodity buried in the idea of a commode. <laughs> okay. A commodate. You understand what I'm talking about? It's the whole idea of comfort and being able to find a sense of relaxation and security in your environment. A commodious environment is a welcoming environment that's big enough to take you. What are commodity futures? Uh huh. A commodity is, in this, in that sense, an extractable unit that's for sale that you are able to put your hands on and take someplace and sell somewhere. Primary and secondary definition of these two terms reverses during this period of time. Take another one. Profit. What profiteth a man if he were gains the world and loses his soul? Anybody enough of a biblicist to know where that comes from? You put it on the sheet. I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
all of you are biblicists enough to know about that. The idea of profiting from someone's advice. You understand what, I, what I'm talking about? The idea of somehow finding enrichment and enlightenment in something. That used to be the primary definition of that word. It becomes the secondary definition when profit is financial gain realized from the sale of personal property. And you can see how radically different these concepts are. Something's happening during the period of time when these word reversals begin to happen that makes these words reflect some bunch of big, deeper processes. And that's what we're going to try and talk about today. How much time do I have? I can't remember. Oh, I get that. Okay. okay, so what I'm doing here is, on this worksheet, giving us a way to walk through a set of processes that, on the one hand, involve a world that we've lost. If you were to transport us back to colonial New England in the 17th century and say, all right, figure out how to survive, we wouldn't know how to do that. People are making their own stuff. People are cutting their own wood. People are chasing their own animals. People are doing all kinds of stuff. Nobody goes to the store. <laughs> okay. I don't, so, and it's a world that we've lost in a lot of different ways. But it's also the beginning of the world that we're in. <laughs> and so trying to put those two things together in a way that we can all understand both working together. And at the same time, add something very foreign that we know nothing about, really which is how did Indians live in the midst of all this? That's all the task we have today. <laughs> okay, So I'm going to walk through point by point by point really simply in this worksheet that goes on to the back in a way that will take us from 1630, want and plenty, to 1800, the ecological collapse of New England, which is exactly what happened. How do we get from that point to that other point? And I think we do that by starting out with how Indians lived. Now we're talking now about Narragansetts, Micmacs, uh, Wapanoaks, and a few other groups that you can think of. Dominant if you walk into New England before settlers show up from across the Atlantic and begin to understand what's going on in the woods, you find out it's a very complicated process of mobility all the time that's going on in the woods with people moving around. Native American cultures are always in the business of going south. Uh, one way to be able to illustrate the story is to simply remember that there are legends that are true up in Maine about being able to float down the Allagash River with the Indians in the spring as they plant their crops. As they end up on the coast fishing and hunting and then coming back in August and September to pick up those crops and go somewhere. What you find is a real patchwork of the environment. Native peoples understand, one way or another, that the woods is something to manage. The idea that somehow you live in harmony with the environment in some sort of uh, really mystical way. Can you hear me as I begin to wander? Oh, good. I'm getting over here. <laughs> I can't do that, though, can I? Can I move? No, you got to stay here. All right, damn. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. If, if you were a scout coming from England to look at the woods as you come up on the shore, you'd think you were in a park. You wouldn't find a lot of tangle. You wouldn't find a lot of bramble. You'd find a lot of big, big trees. And what was underneath them had been burnt off by Indians who put fires through the woods all the time with the idea of creating edge environments. 
Anybody enough of an ecologist to know what an edge environment is? That's a place where, um, what, camouflage meets open ground for animals. Edge environments are places where you can begin as a human being to see where the deer are and where the deer want to come, partly because of the fact you've planted your crops there. Indians plant crops by girdling trees and then planting around them. What they plant is a mixture of what we today would call corn, beans, peas, various forms of squash. They're all in there together. Sort of big jumbly garden of stuff. Women take care of those elements while men hunt. And everything moves around. There are no fixed boundaries. Everybody understands where things are. Every, everybody understands what pieces of real estate are used for. But in a sense that we would understand it, nobody owns anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. And so when you look there, that's the first thing you see if you're the scout. The second thing that you see if you're the scout coming from England is a kind of natural abundance that just blows you away. You've never seen anything like this before. You've been living in a settled society that hasn't had enough wood on its property for 200 years. Every natural animal that you can find in England has been overhunted. That's why the king has his hunting preserve. So he can keep the stags. Nobody else has. The idea that you can walk into the woods and suddenly see a flock of turkeys that's so big that it blots out the sun when it goes up in the air by itself. Or watch the alewives come down the river and jump out because there's not enough room for them. Or where you can, if you're skilled, catch salmon with your bare hands. That looks to someone coming from a place like England like magic. And to Indians, it's normal. From their point of view, there's always enough. <laughs> okay? Now, enough is a very, very what, fungible term. Because the way that Indian cultures worked back then, nobody saves anything from one year to the next with the idea that it's going to get more valuable. Everything is perishable. Everything gets used. And when the snow falls, and when the crops go away, and when the big animals hibernate, you go without. And that's natural. You cut back. Seasons of want, seasons of plenty. Okay? This doesn't mean these are noble savages who understand all kinds of things about the rhythms of the earth and everything else like that. It's just a very sensible way for a mobile culture to live. Because you don't settle down anyplace. And you know where all the things are that you need to have. You also know who else is using them. Okay, if you're an Englishman and suddenly you show up, you see all this plenty. I had an experience once where I was at the, above the arch vaulting at Salisbury Cathedral in England to see what kinds of wood truss work was up on the top of that thing. This is, uh, this is architecture that's built in the 11th century. You're looking at oak beams like that, straight up with grain, which is the same forest that you see in the 17th century in New England. All of that's been gone in England forever. So the minute your spy comes in and starts looking, looks at the tree, what does he see in the tree? He sees timber. He sees a vendable commodity. He sees something that's valuable someplace else, correct? 
It's a perfectly human thing to do. It's no less human than what I've just been describing the Indians doing. But you're coming from someplace else with a different set of values to begin with, okay? So when you come as a Puritan settler, and you settle in New England, instead of fitting into the notion of seasons of want and plenty, your idea is to conserve. Your idea is to settle. Your idea is to be in one place. Your idea is to create boundaries. Why? Because that's what you've always done. What you did in England. You see the, you see the English countryside, it's hedgerows, isn't it? It's all fences. It's to keep things in, it's to keep things out. This Indian culture that we're talking about is a semi-permeable kind of thing where stuff goes out, stuff comes in. So the idea when colonists meet Indians and they look at the way Indians are behaving, they ask the question, why are these people wanting so much in the middle of such prosperity? What's wrong with them? Do you understand what I'm talking about? They're not developing their resource. Now, there are people right at the time, Englishmen, who understand a lot about what's going on. Roger Williams is one of them. He's a guy who ended up founding his own colony in Rhode Island because he objects to the way that this settlement is going on. There's another guy who's even more interesting, a guy named Thomas Morton, who's a British, an English aristocrat who hates Puritans and wants to hang out with Indians. And the critique that his colonist friends are making is that the Indians are poor in the midst of all this wealth. And he says, this is the quote, it's on your sheet. Now, since it is but food and raiment that men needeth, that men that live needeth, why should not the natives of New England be said to be living richly, having no want of either? You see how the values get reversed here? And why that particular way of being able to... The thing that's so maddening about this environmental history, people critique the dominant things that are happening right off the bat to say they're wrong. That you're not seeing this the right way. And it's not the idiots that are saying it, it's other colonists that are saying it. It's not that we're single-minded about this stuff. We can have cultural insights that make us critique our own behavior. I just gave you one right here, or Thomas Morton did. Okay, so that's the scene that we want to set. Now, I'm going to give you some names. Those Indian names that I've given you, Agwasikuk and Chabangakagongomuk, <laughs> are words that define places. Each defines what's supposed to go on in that place. The first, once you translate it, is it's the place where we get together to talk. The second is you fish on that side of the lake, we'll fish on this side of the lake, and we'll both fish in the middle of If you think about Indian place names, you'll find them all over. You'll find them all over the Midwest, you'll find them all over everywhere. They're all natural descriptions or human interactions of things that go on with natural descriptions, correct? What's New London? See? New London, New Britain, Cambridge. The idea of replicating the culture that you know when you go someplace new, is natural, right? But just by thinking of the place names, you can begin to understand the dynamics that are going on here. The people that are founding New London, New Britain, and Cambridge are people who are looking at what's on the land as something that they want to be able to develop and use and change. Correct? You know what happens to all those big, tall, white pines, right? You ever seen a natural, big, old, tall, white pine? 220 feet high. 
28 inches around to 32 inches around if you get down and try and put your arms around the thing. How many masts for the king's ship do you think you can get on that? What you see inside the natural object is its transformed value as a commodity. It becomes a feature that you want to extract from where it was to have it become something else. That's commodification. Okay? We do it all the time. So there's mobility in those names, just as I was describing before the Indian names. There's fixity in the place names that the English bring with them. And the idea of being fixed and staying in one place and then making that place permanent and then making that place grow and that making that place better for your descendants is the natural best thing to think, right? Why do we send our kids to college? I mean, you can't really critique this stuff very hard without understanding that these are perfectly normal human reactions that we're having here. And we're involved in a much more profound dilemma than just simply saying the Puritans did it wrong. So much harder than that is the lesson that's in the middle of all this. Okay. Now, standing behind all this <laughs> is the King of England, who owns all this stuff in his own mind <laughs> and according to international law. As far as he's concerned, nobody lives there but him and the people that he sends there. And he uses that right to be able to create revenue and wealth for himself by allowing people to develop investment corporations so that by moving to New England, the Massachusetts Bay Company and I mean that, that a company, it's a joint stock operation with a bunch of people invested in, are going to realize a profit. Correct? Okay, so here's their charter. <laughs> and this is the sovereign speaking here. To have, to hold, possess, and enjoy all and singular of the aforesaid continent, lands, territories, islands, fishing, with all manner of commodities, royalties, liberties, and profits that should cut should henceforth arise. See our two words in there? With all their appurtenances and every part and parcel thereof unto said council and to their successors forever. There's a big set of assumptions about how you use things to create the future that you've got in your head, right? It's all predicated on commodification. It's all predicated on the idea of transforming what's there into something better. And we call it progress. Okay. Now, meantime, who's really running the countryside for the past 10,000 years? Who's been running the countryside for the past 10,000 years? A bunch of people called sachems in New England. Got a bunch of other names to decide, but that's a good enough one. These are people who have <laughs> developed enough consensus judgment in their individual ability to continue to converse with the community to be able to present a larger collective understanding of what the community wants to another sachem who's doing the same thing. <laughs> That's how you get a wonderful phrase, like you fish on your side of the lake, we fish on our side of the lake, we both fish in the middle. It's a conversation. Right? And it also assumes, in a variety of different ways, that the whole business of sovereignty doesn't exist. Okay? What exists instead is a kind of... Management by consensus with different groups who live in different places who share the same space. Okay. So we have the sovereign, we have the sachem, and you can't imagine two more diametrically opposed ways 
of understanding the relationship between political power and resources, correct? So, we're right to the next point, which comes real fast. What we've been talking about is the establishment of private property rights in New England, haven't we? Isn't that what that is? Okay. Now, and this is a real well-developed set of ideas by the time it gets to New England. And it's the same set of ideas that allows you who owns their own home. All of us do is private property. A, me, owns B, my house, against C, which is everybody else in the world. Isn't that right? My legal claim to my private property can be, and this, this is when law gets really tough, can be infringed on by the state if you want to do eminent domain. If you want to take extreme action of one kind or another to transgress property rights, but you better be ready to go to court and do a ton of different things in order to be able to make that happen. In other words, the possession of things becomes codified as something that is so universal that we don't even think about it anymore. Except when somebody comes along to take it away from us by illegal means, and that becomes crime. And it's something that's even become so embedded that uh, you get things like uh, the castle doctrine where you can defend your private property by arms against anybody coming at you. Or even if you're not, it's the idea of self-ownership that allows Trayvon Martin to die in Florida. In fact, it started a long time ago, the Black Lives Matter. You see how this whole business of, of individual rights and the development of the community go together in a certain way. And sachems and sovereigns have very little understanding of each other at all when something like this happens. So the colonial theory of ownership is real easy. A owns B against C, where C represents all other individuals. English definitions of property commodify Indian common lands. Just walk into them. You know how they've been used. Just describe how they've been used, right? You walk into it. You don't see anything there but you. Who owns this? Who's going to show me a title to it? Nobody. Somebody's going to give you a lot of different stories about how this land has been used for a long, long time, but those are so far out of your cultural frame of reference that they're very hard for you to understand unless you're Roger Williams. You know how I did it? Started learning the language. <laughs> Multiculturalism has its benefits. Okay, so how do Indians look at all this? Well, it's pretty clear. I'll just give you, okay, there's a guy named Thomas Pynchon, who was the third bastard son of some English aristocrat who's come along with the Massachusetts Bay Company. Since he can't have any inheritance of his own in England proper, he's going to become a big land baron in Massachusetts. This is a very common thing to have happen. He makes a deal with a bunch of Wapanoags for a Behisa property, a property agreement where the property goes to Pynchon. Now, this is Indian property. He's negotiated this with Indians, all right? They face to face done this together. The Wampanoags get 18 hatchets, 18 knives, 18 hoes, and agreement, this is in the document, that the Indians will keep, have, enjoy all the planted ground or ground that is now planted and have liberty to take deer, fish, ground nuts, acorns, and peas. What they're saying when they are signing their deed is that you have access to what we have access to. And as a consequence of us allowing you access, we're going to take these hatchets and these other items. But as we negotiate this property rights agreement, 
our idea of what property is is very, very different from yours. It's got an English terminology to it. It's called usufruct property rights. And it means basically that private property is not private. <laughs> Pynchon could come in and use the resources, but the Indians are going to show up again. Now, the Indians on Pynchon's land, we'll just go along with this for just a second longer and then we'll stop. Uh, our people that are there make the agreement, then they leave. Why do they leave? Because they're mobile. Because they're going someplace else. It's because it's this year and it's July and we're supposed to be over here. All of a sudden, in October, they come back. What do they become? They become Indian here, which is where the term comes from. The idea being that one way or another, Indians will sign contracts, and then violate them. They are dishonest. They're not to be trusted. They're savages. Okay. So private ownership, use of fuck property rights. Back up a little bit. We understand sachems and the king, right? We go back further. We go to mobility and fixity. And then we go back further still to where it all starts with the idea of seasons of want and plenty on the one hand, and people coming who insist on the idea of endless and expanding plenty. You should be as comfortable in wintertime as you are in spring. And your kids should be more comfortable than that. Okay. Now, to move to the next level of this. Does the worksheet help you? Okay, good. I, I want to see if this works because these are really complicated kinds of concepts. And I think we'll be doing it again, even with the pictures when we get to the Chicago business next. Improvement, <laughs> accumulation, and waste. We bought a house in 1976. Since then, we've added maybe 800 square feet to it. Nice new deck on the back, bumped out the back end. Expanded the living room, took down the small garage, put up the big garage. It's an investment, isn't it? I'm retired. What am I supposed to be living on? It's all with the idea of planning in the abstract for the thing that you will become when the time is right, right? You will grow into your abstraction to become a concrete future. We all live this way, don't we? That's why we're look at all these white-haired people. I'm 78 years old. <laughs> this is exactly what's going on. My husband's remodeling right now. Sure. So the idea of property being something that you want to improve. The idea that one way or another you have an investment. The investment's not the money that's in it. Only. The investment is intention. You understand what I'm talking about? Okay. So the idea then is to begin to figure out that the thing that you own is yours because it is the reflection of your own labor and aspirations. Perfectly good American things to think about, right? Notice I'm not critiquing this stuff. Because we're way, 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 way too far into it ourselves. It's the way we live. And it's why we're in the mess we're in. <laughs> Two things go together. Okay, what are the Indians doing? Are they improving land? No, they're leaving it to go someplace else. They have natural abundance all around them, and yet at the same time, it doesn't seem to matter to them that they don't exploit that abundance in a way that would make sense to an Englishman. So what are they instead? Indians are not industrious. I'm quoting now. Neither have art, skill, or facility to use the land or the commodities of it. It wasn't hard to find commodity written in lots of these documents. But all spoils, rots, and is marred for want of manuring, gathering, ordering. Because Indians are so few and do but run over the grass 
as do the foxes or wild beasts. Now, there's a term that's really important. They live like animals. Their lands be spacious, void, and free for the taking. Land never, never belonged to them because they never put their print on it to improve it. Robert Cushman is a Puritan minister. Comes over with John Winthrop on the Arabella in 1630. And here's Winthrop himself. As for the natives of New England, they enclose no land, neither have they any steel uh, habitation nor any tamed cattle to improve the land by. It's vacant soil, and he that takes possession of it and bestows culture and husbandry on it, his, it, uh, his right it is. In other words, cheers. Okay, that's an ideology of conquest, isn't it? It's a way to be able to say, what I'm doing is right here, no doubt in my mind. This is sanctioned by every moral code that I know about. It's sanctioned by every historical precedent that I've ever been involved with. It's been it's sanctioned by what my parents taught me. That's why I came to New England in the first place. So there you go. All right. Notice Winthrop is talking about cows. Now we're going to start to get to the real ecology of things. We've been talking about ecology, but we've been talking about different ways of being able to envision how what's out there gets used, right? Now we're going to use it. We've heard how the Indians use it. Indians hunt all the time. The further north you get, the more you hunt and the less you uh, put down agricultural roots. If you live in Maine or he headed up into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, you hunt all the time because there's nothing to grow. <laughs> further south you get towards Boston and Cambridge, the more agricultural the Native Americans become. And they do this kind of swidden agriculture, that's what it's called, you do a lot of burning. And then you do a lot of planting around trees and things like that, while at the same time you maintain edge environment so you can hunt while you're at it. Women do all the preparation and that kind of stuff. Men go out and hunt. Okay. By the way, colonists take a look at men hunting. Who do they see? What do they think is going on? They think they're a bunch of guys playing around out there. Because hunting in England has become a sport of the aristocrat. That's why Robin Hood is such a problem. <laughs> He's off screwing around in the King's Woods. And the whole idea of poaching is the idea of transgressing private property in order to be able to take somebody else's animal that belongs strictly to that person. Okay? The Indians that we've been talking about, they're going out in the woods, don't believe that the animals they're hunting belong to anybody. <laughs> okay? They belong to anybody who can run into them and use them. So when Winthrop starts talking about cows, and the sage of is thinking about this year's deer hunt, can you feel the difference? Who's doing that? Thank you. <laughs> um, the cow doesn't have a history in Indian country. Neither do pigs. Neither do horses. These are all domesticated animals that come from England along with everything else that showed up. Each belongs to someone. In the early days, the cows walked around in the woods, eating whatever they wanted. So did the pigs. But each one had a brand on them, or an ear cropped. Indian would never say, all right, this is my deer. I'm going to put a W on him for Wampa Yellow. Don't you, don't you knickknacks go out to that deer. When the cow goes through the woods, the cow is a piece of private property going out into the common doing things, right? We'll talk about the impact of hooved animals in the middle of the forest in just a minute, because it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. Or pigs, who are even more devastating. Anybody understand what feral hogs do? 
in Wisconsin. Feral hogs are the worst things in the world for the natural environment. And hogs breed real quickly. Okay, so all this private property comes over in animal form with the idea of animal husbandry. Husbandry is not a matter of being a husband in the sense of in a familiar relationship. It's with the idea of using resources in order to be able to create more resources. Animal husbandry. Husbanding resources well means conserving them in order to be able to get more of them. Another one of these English terms, you got it? Everybody still over there? <laughs> this is the hardest thing to do. Okay, so while they're walking through the woods, all of a sudden, Englishmen with guns are figuring out that there are other things that they want to hunt out there just like the king used to do, the deer, the moose, all that. They want to get rid of animals that threaten their own animals, so they put huge bounties on wolves. And all of a sudden, the wolf population goes like that. Englishmen discovered that something else that's important is these wonderful little animals called beavers. Are, their pelts are worth thousands of dollars if you can turn them into hats and coats and sell them in England. And who knows how to trap those things? Indians did. So the idea of telling the sachem, we want to borrow some of your guys, we'll pay them. They don't have to hunt anymore. They don't have to be involved in this moving around kind of agricultural thing. They can work for us. Traps and beaver, bring in the pelt, we'll pay you things. So we begin to get Indians involved in what is the primitive form of the cash economy. And a dependency on colonists for the resources that they used to be able to develop for themselves. You understand quickly what I'm talking about? I'm trying to keep an eye on the time because there's a bunch of stuff to go. All right. All of what I'm talking about here is something that a big book was written about a long time ago that's really, really influential by a historian named Albert Crosby called The Columbian Exchange. And The Columbian Exchange goes on all over the Western Hemisphere. And it can explain real quickly why Indians seem to vanish so that 90% of them die over a very short period of time from things like yellow fever and measles. And how a great demographic collapse begins to happen in the middle of everything else that I'm talking about here. Along with the Columbian Exchange comes fleas, cockroaches, and lots of things that have never been seen on this side of the world before. Meantime, the forest is something that you begin to use as your common to bring into your private development of property. Who owns the trees? Well, we don't know. There's a woodlot out there. Let's build a joint stock company and get masks for the king. Let's be Pepsi-Cola and bottled water out of Lake Superior. Same thing. It's the idea of using common to extract private units in order to be able to invest and create profit. Exactly the same thing. What else do we use this wood for? They build houses in New England that would drive an English aristocrat crazy. There's so much wood. They build these huge half timber houses that then they have to heat with incredible amounts of firewood. So while the cows are walking through the woods and the pigs are uprooting things and uh, Indian culture is being um, taken apart and the natural animals that are normally there are now being seen as big game. <laughs> the common is involved in all that. But then with wood as well, then suddenly you realize you can make barrel staves out of hickory. Who needs barrels? Slaveholders in Barbados and Jamaica need them. Because they can't grow anything down there but sugar. No, not sugar. What is it? Yeah, sugar. Yeah, to begin with, and get all 
tied up with this. You notice they're like huge. What do they need? They need pickled beef because they don't have any. Suddenly you begin to see the whole forest being turned into a commodity for all kinds of different reasons. And after a while they figure out that if you burn enough wood, you get potash. And if you get enough potash, you can make lots and lots of soap. You can make lots and lots of gunpowder. And you can sell that on the open market. You can't make that stuff in England because nobody can burn that way. It becomes an export crop. <laughs> okay, so here's the ecology of New England. Uh, the forests end up being taken to suddenly they discover water power creates milling opportunities. And suddenly you begin to mill this stuff right there in your backyard and send it in exportable form. It's the difference between a pig and a pork chop. You understand what I'm talking about? After a while, the pork chop is just a pork chop and you don't have to have the pig to explain it anymore. We'll talk about that a lot more when we get to problems like refrigerator cars and how you, how you move meat and stuff like that. That's for next time. But you can begin to see how the thing extracted becomes divorced from the thing it came from. That the water comes from a bottle. The idea of the commodification of things is to make them very tangible in their own right, but at the same time to obscure their origins. Because what's important is not where they came from, but what you can do with them. Right? Okay, so by the time you've done, you've taken the forest, you've milled, you've fenced, you've got mass, staves, potash, gunpowder, and mega mansions. We're almost to the end of our list here. Where have the English animals gone? They've ended up discovering the clam beds on the beaches that the Indians used to farm. Bulldozed them, ate everything. Looking for new places of forage for pigs, suddenly John Winthrop is exporting pigs that have brands on them off to islands right there in Boston Harbor and in the greater the area of the bay there, so that they can run wild there and then be harvested later. Those are Indian hunting grounds. Can you see what the changes in the land have been as a consequence? <clears throat> we know that if you do uh, a lot of cattle pasturage on sensitive ecology lands, this is one of the big problems with, uh, uh, with the whole business of federal lands in the far west, Grazing your cattle on federal property, what happens to that property is that it ecologically collapses. Suddenly all the soil is impacted. Suddenly all the ability of nutrients to stay in the soil uh, are gone. All of that happens in New England. Fields and fences define finally all the property. And by the time you're done, there's no forest left. The core samples that you can take uh, out of the geology of the place show that over a period of 150 years, temperatures there get a degree and a half hotter. Okay. The problem with soil um, depletion becomes enormous. Suddenly, the British colonists are taking huge baskets full of cheap fish called alewives and distributing them on fields that used to be, when Indians were running, self-regenerating. Once you put the alewives on the land, they stink, they create oil, they have a way of creating acids and chemicals of their own. By 1800, you can't farm in New England anymore. <laughs> Seriously, you can't. And the whole reason why it's so important for New England states to have Western reserves, Connecticut, Massachusetts, all of them have them. 
at the end of the American Revolution. Each of these, and you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing in Virginia. You can do the same thing in Maryland. You can do the same thing in the Carolinas if you want. I mean, all these stories fit together in a certain way. The idea is there has to be another place to renew the political economy of our culture. In Ohio, there is a thing called the Western Reserve. There's a university named after it still. All that, most of Northeastern Ohio, belonged to Connecticut, ceded to the federal government as a consequence of the U.S. Constitution. With the idea that one way or another, you had to have a reserve place to go to when the depletion of your own environment was so pronounced. Now, you'll find the same patterns of development happening. Uh, think of the big names that run Minneapolis. They're all old New England Puritan names. Every single one of them, the Washburns, Pillsburys, on and on you can go. And it's a replication of that culture again in a new way, in a new place, based off this model. Now, you go to New England today, if you drive through Connecticut, what do you see? Woods every place. Woods every place. What do you see snaking through the woods? What you see snaking through the woods are stone walls that used to identify farm boundaries. Right now, the Connecticut River is the cleanest that it's been since the 18th century. It used to be this huge engine of industrialization that had everything to do with textile mills and everything else, because the next phase of New England is all going to be urbanization and industrialization. You can feel it happening. <sighs> And new waves of immigration, we have to talk about Irish and stuff like that. All that now, just like the fences going through the forest, nobody uses the Connecticut River for anything anymore. <laughs> uh, you can go to the ecology station along the line in New London where they show the river coming out, go back up into it again, you find that there's an attempt on the part of sturgeons to get back up in there. All I'm suggesting here with the whole relationship between environment, commodities, culture, progress, improvement, is that we're trapped in something and we're involved in creating something that we can't see the consequences of. Nobody would predict that the fences would be going through the forest. Nobody would pre be predicting that the Connecticut River would be cleaner than it was any time since the 19th century. The evolution of where we are is always a surprise to us. It was a surprise to the Englishman. The deep, real, horrible, hard problem is the idea that the surprise comes as a consequence of having thought that you'd planned it. Do you understand that last point? And what you're left with is what you have to deal with next, along with the question of what did you learn? And I think probably, for now, I think I'll just leave it there. I'm a little bit over time, aren't I? Yeah, uh, we're going to turn the camera off now. Okay. And one of the consequences of that is you're free. <sighs> Pick up your mic and walk with it. <laughs> no, but get your mic. So <laughs> but just pick it off the stand. And I am going to carry this mic around so that if people have questions, we're all able to hear the questions. I so, oh, I'm sorry. Is it on? It's, it's not? Hey, I did the whole thing with the mic off. Oh. Did you hear me anywhere? Oh, wow. Ha! Cool. All right, here I am for real. I don't know what to say at this point. Who has a question? Okay. So, theoretically, what would have happened had the colonists never come here? What would have happened to the population? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's so hard to be able to try to figure out, I spent a lot of time in Central America, spent a lot of time with what remains of my urban cultures. And um, 
some of the most sophisticated uses of both land, water, geographic space that you can possibly think of. And how with a whole different set of assumptions about how the world works. A culture that we wouldn't be able to clue about understanding if we were put there was able to put something together that then on its own also collapsed. I mean, you can't tell. You really don't know. <laughs> Implicit in your question is whether there is a kind of self-sustaining ecology that will continue to regenerate um, equilibrium over a long, long period of time? The answer to that question is probably not. I mean, you can begin to think of other places that have nothing to do with what we're talking about, but do get us very heavily into what we're going to be talking about the last time when we start talking about the, uh, uh, the whole business of aquaculture and the uh, aridity. Think about China and dams. Uh, think about, and we'll talk about this a lot, uh, think about the whole idea of controlling the Nile and the creation and the creation of pyramids. And the whole idea that somehow humans are designed in one way or another, no matter where they are, to say, we can do this differently and therefore better. This is, I think that's where your question really is. Isn't it? Yeah? Is there such a thing as sustainability, really? Well, that's, yeah, right. Or uh, the question is, is it possible for the first time to understand how profoundly unsustainable we've always been to invent sustainability, whereas we've never had it? I mean, I don't have an answer to your question, but I do know that nobody's ever asked those kinds of questions until about the past 25 years. Well, yeah. Now, you know, populism is a problem, though, because <sighs> very influential, I say, by Thomas Malthus, which is all about the arithmetic development of agriculture and the geometric growth of population, right? And Malthusian paradoxes and stuff like that we talk about all the time. Then you take a look at Japan and you wonder what the hell is going on. Or the fact that our own society cannot sustain its reproductivity without immigration. <laughs> We're not good enough to keep us going. The questions of why population explosions happen in certain places and <laughs> population implosions happen in other places is something that's taken that Malthusian idea and made it whole lot more complicated. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, you think about really high-tech societies is not being able to re reproduce themselves is because those high-tech societies are so high-consuming in their own right, they don't need anything else. They don't need children. <laughs> the, economic, the, 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 the basic old traditional economic reason for having kids doesn't exist. I mean, all the kids are today is, 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 is you know, a big challenge about tuition. <laughs> <laughs> they can put it that way, they can't, you know, they can't even start with that way, can they? Yeah. Sure. yeah, I read somewhere where... Oh, you, not me. Okay. The towns in Massachusetts that end in a field, like Springfield, Greenfield, oh. were actually areas where Indians planted. There was Indian agriculture. We, we had this, this roaming thing, but the fact is, those towns with the last name field were Indian planting areas. Oh, sure. I mean, you, if you walk through the woods and if you want to be real much more detailed, you can see the places where Indian agriculture is taking place or will be taking place or has taken place. Uh, you'll find that out by the way that the trees are girdled. You'll find out by the amount of open space there is so that sunshine can get in. Uh, you can find out from a lot of different reasons that Indian agriculture has an imprint on it which is just as unmistakable as 640 acres in a box. Yeah. And so 
when you get to Springfield and so forth. Those are adaptations by Englishmen of lands that they have taken right. Right. as Indian land that they saw as being waste and that they're improving. So it's, it's another way to be able to express in a place name, different way than I've been doing. There was a stationary aspect that part of their lifestyle. Oh, yeah, everybody knows where it is, but they come back to it. The idea is you're not creating new forms of agriculture every time. What you're doing is you're following a pattern of well-developed places that you go to do these things. Okay, if I've given you the impression that one way or another everybody just runs around the woods fighting wherever they want, no, they don't. And a lot of it also has to do with, this is hard to talk about, but we'll do it just for a second. Depends on where beaver dams have broken down. Depends on. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. It depends on where, after a while, you can begin to find how natural environments have changed around you so you can begin to exploit them forever. If you take a big beaver pond and it drains, what's in there? Nutrient, 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 nutrient. That can become a farm food for an Indian like that. And what it will be is a replenishable sort of thing once, they, once you do it that way. <laughs> when Springfield gets its hands on it, suddenly you're using Yale Watch. And it's a great deal different. Here's a question back here. Yeah. I have a question about water. Because, like, when we go to Mexico, we're not supposed to drink the water. Yeah. But Cortez survived. And when the English came here, they survived. So. What's changed? Have the people changed or has the water changed? How about California? Oh, bacteria. Uh, <laughs> How about the water that didn't used to be there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's all environmental degradation that's come as a consequence of the past 400 years of occupation. Yes. I mean, you go to a place like, as you notice my tan, mm -hmm. just back from Costa Rica. Costa Rica, it all comes out of the tap. How's that happen? I could give you a long history about why Costa Rica's whole colonial development was different because it didn't have lots of Indians and it didn't have any precious metals. And nobody was interested in going there. We've got a question. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, Professor, um, when you talked earlier about how the Indians moved around so much. Yeah. Um, did they have any sense of a community at all? And how did they, what did they do for shelter? Okay, shelter is something you take with you. Uh, this will not be true in upstate New York. This will not be true in other parts of what you would call the north. Uh, once you get up into Mohawk country, you get into villages that are really big time things that have big long houses that stay there. Uh, because they're much more tied to lake travel, much more tied to the business of being all the way out here to Minnesota and lots of other places. The whole Mohawk Confederation is really an urban setting set out in something that looks kind of like the woods. You don't take it apart, you don't take it down, you don't put it in place off. But if you're an idiot living in Massachusetts, you pick up your stuff and take it with you. That's your property, the stuff you can take with you. Uh, what happens is that uh, the various ligatures that hold scaffolding and uh, uh, the interior work of skin houses together, all collapses. You, you put it on a sled and you take it with you. Uh, the community moves. People aren't moving as scattered individuals. People are moving as very clearly defined ethnic communities who always call themselves invariably, we are the people. Same way that you go to the Brazilian rainforest today, put a, put a microphone in front of an indigenous person who knows perfectly well that that whole huge world is out there coming after them. And we're staying on the other side of this big frontier because they don't want that to happen. Yes, who are you? You say, we're the people. <laughs> the community is its own center of its own explanation. That's all you need to have. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's about how it worked. Yeah, sure. I like, I like how you mentioned the scout coming here and seeing the abundance. Subsequent generations, we've gotten used to seeing a lot less. How do we communicate this shifting baseline to the next generation? Oh, it's so interesting. Read Henry Thoreau's diary. I mean, Thoreau goes out to Walden. There's a lot of stuff about Thoreau. 
Thoreau was actually living about 15 minutes from his mother. He's out there in the woods. I mean, it's really going to put it The Thoreau that invents the kind of Thoreau that you listen, that you read about in the real Thoreau. Thoreau spends most of his time in his diaries lamenting the memory of what other people have told him about Bummons. And the idea that one way or another there's always this wistful time that you could never get back to was for him, and for most people who tell this story, extremely disempowered. It's the world we have lost. We can't get back. Last passenger pigeon dies in 1902 in a zoo in Cincinnati. Passenger pigeons that need the scout are so thick that they do darken the sky. When it's gone, it's gone. It's like you, know, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. You know, put up a party line. Yeah. That, that whole lyric pretty much gets at it. We don't, the idea is not to draw a lesson about ecology, but instead, for most people, I think, speak just for myself, but I think probably for them too. It's a realization of how implicated you are and how that happened. And not quite knowing how to be able to step outside that to do anything different. Because we'll just go to the mall, right? So is this the real guy of a podcast? <laughs> 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 no, but I, no, I, the, the question is such an important one. Is there a lesson here? I mean, the reason you come to ask the history, the historian, how did we get this way? is to try and learn a lesson. Uh, the, the past is supposed to be this, what? <coughs> this lamp of experience. You know, if you shine it around, you can see kind of what's up there and how you got there and what you can do to find alternate pathways between things. And that's really, I think, what you're asking about. And when it gets to this level of thinking about who we are, what we're wearing, how we got to where we are, there's not an, uh, this is, to get back to the way the whole thing started today, this, your question explains a, a lot about why this is such a scary subject to work with. It just is. I have a question. They got one over here too. Okay, and I'll bring the mic over, but <laughs> um, I have read that the Indians were fighting incessantly. If they had no conception of private property, why were they fighting? What were they fighting over? Okay, a lot of Mostly about kinship. Uh, one of the things that is hard for us to describe is the idea that one way or another, you stabilize and enrich your community by capturing other people. Okay? Uh, this has a lot to do with what goes on in upstate New York where you've got more subtle kind of society, but it's also true in southern New England as well. There's things called mourning wars. M-O-U-R-I-N-G, wars. What happens is that when your group gets one way or another betwixt in between hard times, the power and legitimacy of your group, if you're a sage of, if you're all kinds of different things, is measured by how big your clan is. And who's in it? And the idea that one way or another you go capture these other guys, put them through a process which is something very, very grueling, of basically stripping people of their identity and adopting them, and turning them from being micmacs into Narragansetts, is a lot of what caused a lot of the warfare. It's, it's clan violence is what it is. You can see it that way. It's not a quarrel over resources, except human resources. So the idea of being able to be able, the Iroquois did this all over the place. I mean, if we could just jump to another different part of the geography. <laughs> this is one of the biggest war machines you've ever seen in your life, right now. It's all about. It fights everybody. Creates a nice big confederation right around the Finger Lakes. Onondagas, Oneidas, Senecas, whatever. Uh, and by the time they're done, they're out here mixing it up with Dakota people and with people in, in, all over, with the idea not just of dominating fur trades and things like that, but of having a big nation of kin, kinship. And so, yeah, they fight all the time. 
But the fighting is not with the idea of conquering. The idea is capture. See the difference? Okay, that's the best I can do with that. I think this lady has a question. I grew up on a farm. My father was a farmer. Uh -huh. And uh, he uh, was a potato farmer. And he hired people to do work. Uh -huh. well, of course, the uh, family worked. And uh, he, one, one year, he hired Indians. They came and put a teepee on my dad's farm. And as a child, we could, we could explore the farm. And, and in the evening, one evening, after dinner, I went out to the, to, it was the east of the wood, the garden. And I went into the teepee. And it was, it was a, uh, it was a good experience. And um, they were very, very nice Indians. I, I still can see, see their features. And did you have a question? Um, I just want, uh, we took land from the Indians. I'm so the, the Indians, uh, they preserve, they're trying to preserve their culture. It's a problem because all the youth are being influenced by the technology. Yeah. And I think, unless you wanted to comment on that, we have just about time for maybe two more questions, so. No, I, I, I think. Okay, this gentleman. When did the cooperation with and learning from the Indians in the 17th century change to the antagonism and the warfare and the taking advantage of them rather than learning from them? Ah, uh, geez. It all goes on at the same time. I mean, when John Winthrop says in 1730, these guys don't know how to take care of property so it belongs to us, he's founding the colony. He's the guy in charge. He's made a set of judgments. He's got an ideology of conquest that comes right there. Meantime, he's got standing next to him Roger Williams, who's learning the language. And Roger Williams is saying, if you make a land deal with these guys, you're not making a land deal with them in a way that you really understand. You have to do it differently. Williams was so big on this, along with freedom of conscience, a lot of other things. They just kicked him out of the colony. And he found Rhode Island to go off and do something else. The point is that cultural criticism of this process that we've been describing goes on right from the very beginning. There are always people who see it. Uh, there's, I mean, if there's a Wendell Berry, who's one of the big, big writers that critiques modern consumer culture from all kinds of different traditional perspectives now, and who has been doing this for 20 years. There's always people like that. There's always a John Muir. <laughs> what was the question? I thought what I've been trying to. What was the question? <laughs> why, can't we, why can't we listen to them? Oh, I see, yeah. I, I think we have time for just one more question. We're almost out of time. And this lady had her hand. Um, I'm not sure if this particular comment is appropriate to this presentation, but one of my concerns is um, the discussion of colonizing Mars, uh, mining asteroids and that, about, again, it seems like kind of a continuation of everything we've talked about, but how much creativity, energy, and resources go into that, or if there's some deep like you talked about earlier, collective mourning going on that we've all, that some people are already assuming this is a done deal here without really putting energy into thinking about what can we do here. That's right. I mean, no, the question is perfectly germane. I mean, how many frontiers have we conquered, supposedly, in our history? Space, <laughs> moon, Mars. The idea that when we're in exploration and discovery is in, in our DNA 
is one of the things that we claim about ourselves as humans all the time, right? We're going to figure out uh, the genome. Think about that. If we're going to reproduce human life, if we can, or if it's ethically possible to do. <laughs> Aren't you doing, in a variety of different ways, what you've always done? but on a level of technological sophistication that really does show that you're the super brain. Because you can create, in a lab, your own replacement. <laughs> I mean, there's, this gets into a whole different literature that you're opening, but it's connected very closely to what we're talking about. It's a literature I don't know very well, which all has to do with the relationship between machines and human intelligence. And it's another topic. <laughs> or another time. We got two more sessions. Come back next week. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs>